Good evening and welcome to the urban.co.uk and National Landlord Association webinar on safety. We are going to go through gas safety, electrical safety, fire safety, Legionella and general regulation. We're very lucky to have with us today Simon Ward who is an advisor from the National Landlord Association. Simon, thanks for being with us and can you tell us a bit about yourself please? Hello, my name is Simon Ward. I'm one of the advisors on the National Landlords Association advice line. Uh, I've been working with the organisation for approximately a couple of years now. Uh, my background with this industry is approximately 15 years of tenancy management in the private and the social sector. Brilliant, thanks Simon. So just getting started um, on safety. So with gas safety, what are the rules and is there any exemptions we need uh, or is there any exemptions that a landlord can have uh, against getting a certificate? Okay, certainly. Well, exemptions, no, not really. Um, if your property has gas, a domestic property has gas, you do have to have the gas safe registered engineer certificate. Uh, obviously, if the property doesn't have a gas supply, then naturally you wouldn't need one, though that wouldn't necessarily qualify as an exemption. There are a few bits and pieces with regards to exemption in certain circumstances. It usually does not apply to domestic properties. However, it, the information on this can be quite detailed, but it is all available on the HSE website and they give quite concise information about any possible exemptions, though they probably wouldn't really apply to domestic properties. And what, what is the exact HSE website? Um, it's hse.gov.uk. Okay. Um, and can can a landlord carry out the test themselves? No, they can't. It has to be done by a gas safe registered engineer. Okay, um, and we, we get a lot of questions about gaining access uh, to do a gas safety. Uh, for example, sometimes the landlord struggles to arrange an appointment with the tenant or the tenant won't let them in. Um, do, could this leave the landlord liable? Potentially, yes. It's interesting that you say that because this is quite a common uh, query on the advice line. We often have people who are in this situation who are phoning up about this and I have experienced it myself as a landlord and it can be a bit tricky. But there are ways to reduce the liability. There are certain ways of circumvention which is worth talking about. Um, what you do have to do is you have to rule a few things out really. The best thing to do is to contact the tenant uh, and ask them is, is it due to inconvenience. Sometimes it might be more convenient for the tenant to be able to arrange the appointment with the gas safe engineer themselves. Mm -hmm. If that's the case just check with the gas safe engineer that you intend to use that they're okay with you giving out their contact details to the tenant and if the tenant is saying this is what the issue is then leave them to arrange them themselves and then ask the gas safe engineer to report back to you once the test has been done. Um, it's a good idea to back this up in writing as well. Um, if this doesn't appear to be the case then generally what is a very good idea is to write to the tenant okay and you should ask the tenant or request that the tenant cease to use all gas appliances immediately because they haven't been tested to be safe and potentially maintained if maintenance is required um, you should point out that if the tenant does continue to use gas appliances that remain untested and against your wishes and against the regulations, then any loss, injury or detriment to themselves, their visitors or their property will actually be, uh, the liability will fall on the tenant, not the landlord in that situation. Um, what you can do in the letter as well, another tool you have is that you can threaten to serve notice on the tenancy if the tenant's not going to comply with this and it's a fairly straightforward, objective conversation. As a landlord, you just need to say, I need to adhere to these requirements in order for the property to be safe. If you're restricting me from carrying out my legal functions and duties, I have no choice but to bring the tenancy to an end in order to safeguard all, those, all parties that are involved. Um, another throw of the dice of what you can do is that you can apply to the county court to obtain an injunction to enter the premises to carry this out. Even though it's a costly exercise, it does work. It doesn't usually take too much time uh, and the costs of which you can actually pass on to the tenant. You can ask the tenant to pay those. If the tenant refuses to, then you would be able to pursue that as a money claim and I should imagine with success. So uh, some of our landlords, uh, we've had one situation, have said to us that um, well, I've got in my contract that I need to give 48 hours notice mm. um, for an inspection. So yeah. that's fine. All I need to do is 
give 48 hours notice of entering the property and then I can and then I can go in. Does, does that work or does that not work? I would advise against that because mm-hmm. entering a property, even for these reasons, without the appropriate permission from the tenant, could actually result in an incident where the landlord creates a trespass. Okay. Because the tenant ultimately, uh, under, the, um, uh, under the 1988 Housing Act, has the right to quiet enjoyment as one of the principal facets of holding the short, short-hold tenancy. Um, so any any uh, unpermissible entry by the landlord, unpermissible f- from the tenant's point of view, that is, could actually be deemed as trespass without their permission. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be a bit of a sticky situation. I have heard uh, of instance years ago where landlords have accessed the property without the tenant's permission for various reasons, and the tenant has been quite unhappy about this and has come up with some various spurious accusations as a result of uh, mm. feeling wronged by the action. Uh, an example of one being that they've actually, you know, I've heard of a case where a tenant reported um, a theft to the police, yeah. which he was pointing his finger at the landlord. Uh, upon the investigation, it was inconclusive, there was no evidence, but it was a nasty shock for the landlord involved to have the police all of a sudden contact them saying there's been a report of the theft. Yeah. Have you entered the property? You do realise this is trespass. Not that the police can do really do anything about trespass because it's a civil offence, but I have seen these situations come where the trespass has become heated between the tenant and the landlord if it becomes aggravated, it could be a criminal offence. It could be a criminal issue rather than the police might need to involve because you could have, <laughs> enter into issues of a fray or mm. bodily harm or, you know, if things get really, really nasty. So so this 48-hour clause within tenancy just doesn't work, really? Is well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to enforce, that's the thing. Sure. I mean, it's important to have it in there, I think, anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think tenants do need to adhere to that. Um, what you can do is that if a tenant does is in breach of a clause, you could serve the appropriate notice, uh, which would be a Section 8 notice using an appropriate ground, Mm -hmm. uh, which would relate to um, the breach as such, but it would be a discretionary ground anyway, so a judge would not necessarily have to award possession Mm. if faced with the facts in court. Mm. So it's it's interesting because so many landlords put things in their tenancy agreements thinking, well, it's in writing and I've got a signature, so therefore I can do this. That's right. Um, And in so many cases with those kind of clauses, they just don't hold up. Well, statute Um, tends to override it, you see. That's the issue, statute does override it. Um, I mean, not all tenants do understand that, so often when they sign the agreement, they do think that the clauses are legally enforceable regardless, and uh, it's very much a black and white issue. Mm. Uh, Sometimes we suggest to landlords that you might just want to serve a Section 8 notice as a prompt. Mm. You know, in order to get something done, uh, this is something that you could do if a, if a tenant was obstructing your access. You could serve a Section 8 under the appropriate ground, which would, I believe would be ground 12, which is some other function has not been performed by the tenant other than one, you know, one that's not related to the payment of rent. Mm. Um, and that carries 14 days notice. If you put that through to the tenant through the letterbox with a witness for your proof of service, um, it can act as a bit of a scare tactic and you may well get a phone call from the tenants within a few hours or a few days trying to rescind the situation and give you what you need to have which in that case that's fine it's worked perfectly and you just simply don't push for possession once sure. the notice period on the section 8 has expired so that that's that's a good um, bit of advice for our landlords that there is a whole load of legislation which underpins your tenancy agreement and can override your tenancy agreement so that's right. so it's best if you're thinking of um, changing things adding things to your tenancy agreement it's best to call the advice line or us and and just get some advice as to whether it'll actually hold up absolutely yes we, we can certainly advise whether something is balanced or enforceable absolutely okay um, so perhaps a bit more of a simpler question um, how do I check that my engineer is qualified to do a gas safety Okay then, right, well, then what you do is that um, they will have an ID card, okay, and on the ID card there's a seven digit number on there, okay, mm-hmm. and you can look this up on the Gas Safe Register website, which is gassaferegister.co.uk, okay, um, and if they're genuine they'll be there. I mean, you obviously you have to ask for the ID card anyway for your yeah. own security, that's the first thing anyone should do. Sure. Once they've shown that, if you do have any concerns, just make a note of the seven digit number, put it into the little box on the website and that will tell you that they're registered. 
and make uh, and when you get the certificate, make sure they date it as well. We had a situation recently where the gas engineer forgot to date the certificate, so we we had to go back to him and get it get it all reissued again. So mm. it's very important. Yeah. Um, good. Well, that's that's gas safety covered uh, very well. We will move on to um, CO alarms. Um, when do I need to ins- or where do I need to install a CO, a CO alarm? Okay, well, the CO alarm needs to be installed, legally speaking, it needs to be installed in the presence of any solid fuel burning appliance. It doesn't, by law, have to be installed where there is, for example, a gas boiler, okay? Uh, however, I always recommend that you do put one in there when there's a gas boiler anyway, and this is for a couple of reasons. One, it, it tends to match the expectations of the tenants. Okay, a lot of people do believe that you know by law you need one for gas appliances mm-hmm. as well as solid fuel burning appliances. Uh, it looks very good if you have a yeah. property. It's great to make it very much more marketable anyway. You're you know you're you're taking a very much robust belt and braces approach yeah. to not mucking around when it comes to issues of safety within the home. Okay, um, so I mean when it comes to gas boilers, there is um, I suppose there is a, a spectrum of risk. And this tends to be around whether the gas boiler has uh, an external flue. So if it's the gas boiler is situated on the inside of an external wall, mm-hmm. then the flue just literally is a few inches long and it goes out the back. So in order to e- inspect it uh, for any debris or any clutter or anything that could be blocking it, it's very easy to do. Um, where you've got an internal flue that is actually passing through what we call risk areas in the property, which would be living room or bedrooms, then it's it's obviously a bit more important because there's mu- the, the flue is much longer, so the risk of any sure. leak or any blockage is therefore greatly increased. What you do find in some properties that have the internal flue is that you'll find some boxing uh, kind of in the corner going along the ceiling where there would be sort of coving yeah. would go um, and, and that's what that is. Now there should be uh, at least one inspection chamber mm-hmm. or an inspection hatch in each room. If there isn't, get it sorted is the sure. advice. You need to have that. Would that, um, but you, you don't, legislation doesn't say that you need a, a CO alarm if you've got an internal That's flu, right. but it is good practice to go. It is, yeah, it is absolutely best practice. I mean, I have it in my property. I don't have any solid fuel burning appliances in my property that I rent out. It's just a combi gas boiler, sure. but I've got a CO2 alarm um, next to it. It should be installed no further away than three metres from the appliance. And going over and above on safety is never... <laughs> oh no, I mean, bad idea, here yeah. at the uh, National Especially. Landlords Association, we're on the mind of erring on the side of erring on the side of caution, really. Especially for twenty pounds that it costs. Absolutely. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, what are the penalties for going back to gas safety as well, mm. as well as the CR mm. alarms? What's the penalties for non-compliance? Well, it, it, it's quite broad, really, but uh, it's quite a, a, a quick, easy answer: an unlimited fine. Uh, on potentially a custodial sentence. Okay. It depends on the outcome. Yeah. You know, if it if it results in a loss or an injury or or, or a severe detriment, uh, a loss that could affect someone's quality of life or in, in or some sort of permanent impairment, then the penalty could be very very harsh indeed. A custodial sentence could be being looked at. So it's extremely important to have mm. to have all these, you know, for the safety of your tenants as well, not just about penalties, but it's 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 very important to have your gas safety and your CO alarms. Absolutely, and some of the fines can be astronomical, can be sort of five or six figures, and then obviously, you know, these cases tend to be um, quite well, as well as quite important, they can be complex in nature, they can require quite a lot of time to gather all the information and for the hearing, um, and, and obviously the legal costs tend to be much, much greater as well. So in some of these cases, the, the fine that can be imposed can be not that much uh, different to the actual costs on top of it as well. Sure. Okay, and actually we just had a question come in. Um, on the CO alarms, is there any need to test uh, the CO alarm. Do you have to prove that you're testing it? If if you if you have to have one, if you've got some a solid fuel burning appliance, um, do you have to prove that you're testing it on a regular basis? Well, what you need to do, you need to you do need to test it on a regular basis. And my advice would be to make sure it's in good working proper order before each tenancy that you commence. 
Um, and then I think what you should do as a landlord is that you should sporadically test it. Um, and I would suggest with each periodic inspection sure. is the best opportunity to do that. Just make a note, keep a record of what you've done, where and when, and that should be sufficient. So written, your own written records are fine. You don't have to get the tenant to sign them or anything. You don't have to, no. You don't have to. It would be a good idea to give them a copy of that, but yeah. you don't necessarily need to do that. It's really that you need to do it for your records. Uh, I mean, you know, anything you do when it comes to property management, um, you need to create an audit trail for, you know, anything and everything. It's good practice. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to perhaps what is more of a grey area, um, electrical safety. So um, does a landlord, do we need electrical safety certificates? What's the, what's the legislation around electrical safety? Okay, well the only circumstance where you absolutely by law are required to have an electrical safety certificate is if your property is a house of multiple occupation, or what we generally abbreviate to, uh, to an HMO. And that should be done at least every five years, okay? At least every five years. Um, it's also something, if you've had any major works done, this applies to non-HMOs, but if you have had any major works done, then you do need an electrical installation certificate, or what they're known as the EIC. Um, I can go into a little bit about that because there are various levels of certification for this sort of thing. Um, you, you tend to have the two categories, which is the EIC, as I former mentioned, and then the MEIWC, which is the Minor Electrical Installation Work Certificates. Um, there are three different levels, and either certificate can apply to each of the three different levels. So it does fragment a little bit. Um, but the three different levels is that there's a, a new certificate which would be issued on completion of any new installation or a complete rewire. Uh, there's an addition certificate which is uh, issued when you're adding, say, new circuits to an, an existing installation which contain new plug outlets or light switches or that sort of thing. And then there's also an, there's also an, uh, an alteration certificate as well, which is to be applied for existing circuits that are modified. So, for example, if you're just replacing your consumer unit to a, a new version, then that would be the type of certificate that you would require your engineer to, to issue for you. Um, yeah, so always just make sure that you use an NIC, EIC registered contractor. Um, you can find them out on the website, the NIC, EIC. Or you can also find there's very, uh, another very good little website that I use is competentpersons.co.uk. Okay. Where you can just select, uh, there's a drop down menu where you select, you know, which engineer you're using. Mm -hmm. You select which, which, which one for the type of work and then you can look them up to see if they are a, a, a competent person, basically. Okay, that um, good. So for some of the sort of minor works, um, like for example, if you were just um, replacing a light switch, then you could do this yourself if you felt that you were a competent person. So you, know, you would have to be very, very satisfied that you've got the relevant knowledge and experience of doing this. What I always say to people on the advice line when it comes to this, if you're not sure, if you're not 100%, don't do it. Just yeah. don't do it. Yeah. Get an engineering. So um, this is only for HMOs, though, that you need these certificates? You, well, yes. It's only mandatory for the yeah. HMO. The, uh, the, the regular um, five-year testing certificate only applies to HMOs. It's not a lawful requirement for non-HMO dwellings. So if, if you're providing a, um electrical appliance, mm -hmm. um, which is old and, and wires hanging out and it's dangerous mm. potentially mm. Um, or, or a socket which hasn't been updated for 20 years and could be dangerous mm. where does if there's no legislation in place to say that you have to have that checked mm. where would liability lie if um, if a tenant was to, to hurt themselves okay well there is underpinning legislation but it's not specifically uh, around electrical installation the underpinning legislation is um, Section 11 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. So they're duty bound by this. And in a nutshell, Section 11, I believe it's 2B, actually states to keep in repair the proper working order of the installations in the dwelling house for the supply of water, gas, and electricity. Okay. So you have to be satisfied as a landlord before that tenancy commences that everything is in good, proper working order. You have to do your own evaluation, your own assessment of that, which is really a common sense procedure. You can buy electrical testing kits for this where you have the little, uh, like, like a kind of, 
It looks like one of those uh, plug covers, but it has a little uh, sure. light readings on there, and it can test the current in there, basically. So you can use them for things like light sockets. Um, obviously, when it comes to the portable appliances, then as a landlord, you need to get them pat tested. Mm. Okay, and these should be done once a, every, once a year. Um, sometimes people phone up the advice line and they're not sure really what qualifies as a portable appliance. Well, it's in the word portable. If it can be moved, it's a portable appliance. So some people think yes to a kettle, yes to a toaster, maybe an under-counter fridge, but not to a washing machine because it's so big. Sure. Well, no, the washing machine is a portable electrical appliance and it should be pat tested. Sure. Um, okay. Just as a little plug here, we do have pat testing kits available on the NLA website, which you get a I believe a generous discount as a member. <laughs> okay, so I think it's just a common sense approach then with electricity. It is. No, I mean, the, yeah. There's no legislation forcing you to do this yearly check or a five yearly check, but you've got you've got to be reasonable about it and, and look at the, the condition of your property and and ensure that you're happy. Um, with with the electrical state of your property. Precisely. Uh, the risk assessment approach is by far the best method to do this, I think. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And do the rules differ around the UK? Well, <clears throat> in Wales and Northern Ireland, it's exactly the same as England. The only, um, the only sort of, uh, e exception through devolution is Scotland. As from the 1st of December 2015, uh, all private landlords of domestic dwellings must have electrical safety inspection at least every five years. So in Scotland, it applies to them all. Okay. Um, and in, in terms of if, if an electrical item bought by the tenant goes wrong, there's, there's no liability there, is there? There isn't, no, there isn't, because the tenant's brought it in. So the tenant is responsible for ensuring that their items are, are sound themselves. However, um, if you wanted to be very conscientious about it as a landlord, you could offer to pack test the appliances. But, you know, bear in mind there should be a reasonable limit on that. Some tenants can come in with 40 odd electrical appliances and whatnot. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to ensure that you'd be able to do that to all sure. of them. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So there's no lawful duty, but it is a bit more of a common sense and there's very much a belt and braces approach to things. Sure. So I suppose, you know, as opposed, as opposed to gas safety, where it's a very, very clear procedure of what you need to do with gas. Mm. It is a bit less, it's not as clear with electrical. It's not um, as clear with electrical, no. I know that in, in, in most countries in, 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 on the continent of Europe, then, you know, for these type of uh, rented dwellings, it, it's an absolute must to have electrical safety checks. It, it sure. absolutely is. So I think in, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we're, we're, we're a little bit behind um, the rest of Europe and Scotland with that. However, I would expect to see this come out as in, in statutory law within the next couple of years. It's on the cards. Sure, it's so not a case of if, it's when. I'd say if, if you wanted to be ahead of the game, um, your electrical safety certification every five years, yeah. and then pat testing every every year. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a very, very good idea just to do it anyway, you know, and it also makes your property extremely marketable when you can present that certificate to any prospective tenants as well. I mean, I recommend doing it. It's not a huge cost. It doesn't take up a lot of time. You get ultimate peace of mind from it as well. Um, and yeah, absolutely, I think it's just a good idea. And um, another point with HMOs is that there's also um, a lot of landlords out there that might be running an HMO and not actually know it. Um, so, cause, so it's best to check with your local council if you've got a large property and a lot of, say, professional sharers. Mm. Um, it's best to check with your la local council if, if you are actually running an HMO Absolutely. Um, because you may be um, not adhering to legislation. Absolutely, yes. If in doubt, then contact your local property licensing team. That's, a, that's an interesting point you brought up about the HMOs because Obviously, there's the three different licensing schemes for properties that local authorities issue, which is your mandatory licensing and additional licensing that does apply to HMOs, but also you have selective licensing that applies to non-HMO properties. You may be required, if, you, if your property that you're renting is in a selective licensed area, then the lo one of the prerequisites of issuing the uh, license certificate by the local authority may be that you have an electrical safety check. And if that's what's required, if they're asking you to do that, that's a hoop you've got to jump through in order to get the license. Sure. Okay. So the information's out there. It's just phoning your local council. Absolutely. And obviously, again, if, if you're unsure about any point, um, join the NLA yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and phone, phone up people like Simon who can, who can help you through it. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, so moving on to fire safety, um, which is obviously um, an issue at the forefront of everyone's minds at the moment. Um, what is my duty as a landlord uh, with, regard, with regards to fire safety? Okay, well, I mean, ultimately you have to ensure that you're compliant with all the relevant regulations regarding heat and smoke detection, the um, firefighting equipment, that's not just the provision of it, but also the regular maintenance of it as well, which is one of the factors that I think tends to get overlooked a little bit. That people mm. just think they have to provide. It's obviously essential to maintain as well. Uh, and also planned escape routes as sure. well, um, which it tends to be a bit more uh, a bit more of a pertinent fact for HMOs, but obviously, you know, it, you know, certainly the larger ones, but, you know, it is relevant anyway. Um, any property, any, any any residential dwelling will be effectively categorised into two areas, which is the risk areas and the escape route. Um, so if you just take a two-bedroom terraced house that's let as a single occupancy dwelling or to you know just a family, for mm -hmm. example, then the risk area, the boundary of the risk area and escape route is the front door. The risk area is the entirety of the house because there's only one household living there. Sure. And the escape route is obviously the front path, the garden, the street, wherever the door leads exactly onto. In an HMO, it's slightly different. For example, if you've, say, got an uh, HMO which is uh, various bedsits on multiple floors, then each bedsit is a risk area, and the escape route is what's immediately after the front door of the room, so the escape route is effectively still internal. Mm -hmm. And this is where you need to pay particular attention to with the uh, arrangement of additional firefighting equipment and uh, additional fire doors so you create safety zones of escape. Do you see what I mean? Sure. Mm. sure. So just going back to the equipment, um, we'll talk about smoke alarms, which people were probably more familiar with the requirements, but mm. we'll go over that in a second. In terms of firefighting equipment, blankets, um, fire extinguishers, on, a, on a, a normal residential landlord who's mm. perhaps got a two-bed house or a, or a bed, one bedroom flat, what is the requirement for equipment? Okay, well they're not required to have, a, they're not really required to have firefighting equipment. Um, they're not required to have a fire extinguisher in the property. Mm -hmm. um, the fire blanket should be provided in the kitchen. Uh, this is often something that isn't provided. But the main, the main provisions is of the, the um, smoke detectors have a heat detector and not a smoke detector in the kitchen, otherwise it will go off every time someone burns a bit of toast. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and just make sure that you've got the proper types of the fire alarms installed. Um, and, and also make sure that um, they're tested, obviously, mm. regularly. Um, they have to be tested and recorded to have been tested before the tenancy starts. Yeah. As a landlord, you should also test them on each periodic inspection. But most tenancy agreements will have a clause passing the periodic testing responsibility onto the tenant. And it's mm something that you can leave in their hands to do and they should do that sure. okay um, it's important one of the questions we get often in the advice line is about the life expectancy of um, smoke and heat detectors uh, generally it's 10 years and you should actually change the unit after 10 years because they have a, a, a detection chamber inside the actual unit itself and after 10 years the sensors inside can actually get covered with like a thin res residual layer of dust or maybe grease if it's near the kitchen or that sort of thing so it impairs their efficiency. One of the other main issues that we tend to find on the advice line is when landlords phone up and say, well, the tenants are removing the batteries from them. Uh, and, and what often happens is, and I remember this when I was a tenant many, many years ago, <laughs> is that when the battery is near low, it emits this high-pitched beeping sound intermittently, which is very, very loud and quite irritating every two or three minutes. Well, that's for a reason. It's designed to be damn yeah. irritating, so you run out and get a new battery. My advice to any landlords is to circumvent this by installing the ones with the hard internal battery, which yeah. I believe is the lithium ones, which they cannot be replaced. Sure. They last for 10 years. And it doesn't fit in your remote control either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the requirement for equipment is a, uh, a, a smoke alarm on each floor. Mm -hmm. um, and and you are required by legislation to have a, a, a fire blanket in the in the kitchen. Yes, you should do that. Yes. Okay, which I think is probably, as you said, so a, a part that a lot of landlords do miss out on. It is. I mean, the thing is, as well, is I think if you're going to provide these things, and if you are going to go the extra mile and provide firefighting equipment, it's very important that you give the tenants or you make available to the tenants the the manufacturer's instructions. Yeah. Um, 
for, so for example, when it comes to different types of fire extinguishers, what you often used to find in, 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 in kitchens of, I remember sort of in, in um, accommodation halls for universities, you used to find, um, you used to find carbon dioxide, the uh, extinguishers. Sure. Uh, now, now the problem is with that is that if you're not trained to use it, you could be the person going to hospital just through trying to use it, and not through um, being burned or anything. Well, not from a fire burn, but from a freeze burn. Yeah. If you're holding the nozzle in the wrong place, your hand will stick to it, yeah. and then you and the extinguisher will be going to the emergency room sure. to be surgically separated from <laughs> each other. Uh, and the thing is with fire blankets, y y you know, if you have a chip pan fire, you obviously have to put them over the fire away from you, yeah. not from the back going towards you, obviously, because you're going to push the flames into your face. So when you provide the equipment, it's really important that you provide the necessary instructions on how sure. to do that. Get the tenant to sign to say they've received and understood them yeah. when they're signing the tenancy agreement, mm -hmm. and that way you can ensure that you've protected yourself against any liabilities. I think what a landlord needs to do every now, every, every so often if possible in between tenancies is just to conduct a fire risk assessment of the sure. property okay um, which is you know it is very much a common sense procedure though there are various guidelines on how to do this and you can find this information available on the NLA website we also have fire risk assessment packs that you can buy on the NLA website which are very comprehensive and very reasonable priced for, uh, for, for members if there's anything you're unsure about when you're doing this contact the local authority fire safety officer Sure. And I suppose if you want to go that extra mile and provide fire extinguishers and equipment, you then have to start have to maintain them and ensure they're Absolutely. working as well. So. Absolutely. They, they, they contain a little sticker on them, which is the maintenance record, but you also have to be aware of what fire extinguisher you need for the particular hazard. So, for example, you know, there's, there's no point having a CO2 fire extinguisher for areas which is, the fire is likely to be caused by combustible material sure. because the force of it is going to blow the flames elsewhere and then potentially spread the fire. Sure. So you need to know what fire extinguisher you're using for what purpose. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions coming in now. Um, more, more to do with tenants' responsibilities. Um, if a tenant is smoking in the property and there is fire damage, where, where, where do I stand with that? Okay then, right. Well, um, <laughs> this is assuming then that it's it, it is basically uh, a clause in the agreement that says no, no smoking, smoking and yeah. pretty much, you know, it, it, I would say virtually all tenancy agreements have that now. Mm. Uh, it would be the case where you would add an additional clause to, to allow this. Well, basically the tenant would be in breach. They'd be in breach of the tenancy agreement. Uh, liability of damage would fall on the tenant. Um, provided, if, for example, the damage um, was within, you know, the cost of repairs or replacement was within the amount that you had from the deposit, then that would be a perfectly legitimate claim from the deposit. The tenant would be liable for that. Okay. Um, another one here. Do I have responsibility to ensure that curtains and f furniture is uh, fire compliant? You do, absolutely, you do. For um, soft furnishings and upholstery, there is compliance that you need to adhere to. There is a, it, it is quite a complicated uh, a, a array of regulations, but we do have the full details available on the NLA library. Okay. Um, another one um, about tenancy agreements. Should I put candles, should I put the candles um, uh, are not allowed um, within the property in my tenancy route. I'm not sure that would that would be very enforceable, would it? It's very, very difficult to enforce. I think one of the things um, that, that comes to my mind uh, hearing that question is what if there's a power cut? Sure. You, do you see what I mean? And uh, unless you can, you're can, you going to provide the tenant with wind-up torches and whatnot, I think they're going to maybe possibly reach for the candles and do that. I think to be belt and braces, don't allow it. Have a clause in the tenancy agreement that, that, that forbids any, uh, any use of naked flame. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just to just to recap as well on on full guidance for fire safety. Mm -hmm. um, a, a full guide is available from the NLA, is it? It is available, yes. Uh, on, the NLA, on the NLA library, we have you know, bite-sized chunks of the regulations and the legislation and how it applies to a practical sense for the landlord. But in terms of, if you want to go straight to the guidance, the best thing that I think is out there at the moment is LACORS, um, spelled L-A-C-O-R-S. It's probably the best overall guidance. It contains, what I like about it, it contains really concise diagrams of what you need to do in order to assess the risk of fire and install the necessary detection 
equip and, and fighting equipment for various different types of properties. So it's got some great examples there, and you'll struggle to find an example that doesn't match your property that's available on that website. Okay, brilliant. Um, so just back to documenting uh, testing again, just mm -hmm. to, just to be really clear with people, because it's another one of those questions we get a lot. Um, what would suffice to document that you've tested the alarm? You should do it before that each tenancy starts. Mm -hmm. um, and for your audit trail, for, for your paperwork, what's the best thing to do? Well, I think you know you, you, you can you can get um, you can get some documents available on the NAA website, which are set out in a certain format in order to be able to record this information. Uh, or if you feel competent enough to do this yourself, and you can do this yourself, you just need to make sure that you've got the, the, the key facts there. So you need to be putting the date and the time of the testing, who has tested it, what you've tested, where you've tested it, and what the result is. Okay, and getting the tenant to sign it. You can get the tenant to sign it, that's fine, or if you're, ten if you're doing this before the tenancy started, then you could take anyone who's over 18 as your witness there and they could countersign it. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, it's, it's a good idea as well. If you're doing an inventory, it's a good idea just to insert a page in the inventory perhaps as well and get that all yeah, done in, so. in one document. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So what does HHSRS stand for and, and what is it? Okay, well it's an acronym for Housing Health and Safety Rating System. And what it is, it's a framework for local authority assessment for property hazards in residential and commercial properties uh, in, in connected to risks in order to in order for landlords to ensure they're carrying out their legal functions with, with regards to all aspects of health and safety within the property. So, so how does it work and what does the, the sort of average, I, I think there's probably a lot of landlords who've never heard of this. Um, and so what, what does a landlord have to have to do? Okay then, well it is quite extensive really. I mean, it, it, before it was HHSRS, and I think what a lot of people will still refer this to or may recognise this as basically the environmental health officers. Okay. Uh, the, the teams of what they now call regulatory officers now, is what they tend to be called these days, they have to work under the HHSRS. Um, and you know, often people refer to as the environmental health officers. From my experience, often seems like tenants have a better idea of what this is about than landlords, because often tenants will use various facets of the property that they believe to be a default of health and safety in order to yeah. try and put in legitimate homeless applications to the local authorities to be rehoused by the local authority on the grounds of a property being unfit for habitation. So it seems tenants often have the handle of this more than landlords. But basically the system it actually assesses 29 different categories of risk. Um, within those 29 categories of risk, the assessed risk could fall into one or two additional categories, which are hazard categories. Mm -hmm. So some people may have heard of the category one hazards and the category two hazards. Well, category one hazards are serious hazards. They're serious hazards or breaches. Category two is just referred to as other, so with no sort of immediate threat to endangerment of life or health and safety, but things that need to be looked at pretty sharpish. Um, I won't go through all 29 <laughs> categories, but basically I'll, I'll go through the most important ones, sure. the ones that would tend to relate more to the type of inquiries we have on the advice line. Um, they're kind of put into three overarching categories to try and sort of narrow it down a little bit. The first type is what was determined as physiological hazards. Um, so the best examples of those are things like damp and mould, excess, excess heat or cold, uh, the presence of asbestos, carbon monoxide and fuel combustion products, uncombusted fuel gas, overcrowding and space issues, and noise. Um, they also have a category of protection against infection, which tends to cover water supply, personal hygiene, sanitation and drainage. And then the last category is protection against accidents, and this is, uh, covers falls, so we're talking about falls associated with slips in the baths and the showers, that sort of thing, uh, on level surfaces, so looking at you know, the evenness of floors, uh, on stairs and in between levels. So in between levels, when they say that, they're talking about things like balustrades on the landing, making sure they're solid, making sure the width in between each balustrade is of the correct um, measurement, which must be no more than 10 centimetres. Uh, and then the other ones under protection against accidents, the main ones is electrical hazards and fire safety. So if, um, I mean, if you've got 
a good quality property mm -hmm. and you're covering all the aspects we're talking about today, yeah. it's very likely that, that you're going to be covered on all these 29 points. Absolutely, um, it's, yeah. It's not, are we saying that landlords should run out to the, to the HHSRS and get these 29 points and check, check them all off? Um, it, it, how, how should it impact landlords? Okay then, well I mean basically what they should do is, I don't think they should be going out and calling the HHSRS. And yeah. The thing is, is that the responsibility of the environmental health officers, if they have one issue reported to them, when they come and inspect it, it's their legal duty to inspect the entirety of the property. Right. Sorry. Okay, whether there's any additional risks or not, that's what they have to do. Um, there's very, very good information and guidance for landlords on the gov.uk website with regards to this. So if you put in the search bar HHSRS on the gov.uk website, then it should bring you up with the landlord's guides that's been published by the DCLG. It's obviously all those guides are quite lengthy, but it's, it's about 40 odd pages, 50 pages, but it lists all the 29 categories of hazards and puts them in relative context as to how they may well well apply yeah. on average basis to landlords um, I mean if a landlord is going around and, and, and doing a composite risk assessment check of the entire property before the beginning of the tenancy there's a very good chance if it's being done properly it will cover pretty much most of the sure. hazards obviously the um, gas safety covers um, you know the elements of the, phys phys uh, the physiological hazards mm -hmm. A fire risk assessment covers against protection against accidents, as well as if you were to get an electrical safety certificate done as well, that would also cover that. Um, the landlord is responsible for the inside facilities, which are part of the dwelling, and also the exterior and the structural elements of the dwelling. So, uh, and if the landlord fall foul of the regulations, there are various penalties for this, but then that can be sort of quite overarching because that de depends on the hazard, sure. uh, it depends on the category, uh, depends on the severity and the likelihood of, uh, of the risk or what the outcome would be. Uh, when assessing um, these hazards, uh, environmental health officers, not only do they have to take into consideration the level of risk and the likelihood of the occurrence, but also the vulnerability of the tenants as well. So for example, if you have two tenants in there, one who's 40 years old, fit and healthy, and one who's 80 years old and frail, yeah. they have to assess the risk against the most vulnerable person. That has to be taken into consideration. So it's another common sense approach. Very really. much so. Um, yeah. And as I said, if you're doing everything that we're saying um, in terms of gas safety, electrical safety, fire safety, and uh, we're gonna talk about Legionella in a minute, then you're pretty well covered. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of landlords know the pitfalls of of their properties. Yeah. Um, if you've got a bathroom that's prone to mould, you know, it's it's making sure that you sort out these problems if you know that if you know they exist. Absolutely. Um, as well as adhering to the regulation, and you, and you should be fine. Yeah. Um, but it is worth taking a look. Um, oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You need to. Um, years ago, when I worked in local authorities what would usually happen is it usually starts by the tenants making a complaint about one thing and then the environmental health officer comes down and then maybe finds a few other bits and pieces and has to serve an appropriate notice in order to deal with the hazards. Mm. Um, and we used to find in a few cases that um, you know landlords would sometimes ignore the notices or just not respond for the reasons which I don't know and I'm not going to suggest why, but sure. they could end up with a, a sticky situation um, and you know failure to comply with a statutory notice uh, the penalties is a fine up to a thousand, sorry, up to five thousand pounds, and or the local authority carrying out the remedial work in default and then charging you for it. Sure. And they will use whichever contractors they feel is is necessary mm. for the job, and have to take into consideration the 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 urgency of getting it done as well. So you could end up with a really expensive repair bill, much more expensive than if you'd have identified the problem at an early stage and got it fixed yourself within a reasonable amount of time. So again, I think it comes down to audit trail as well. So Absolutely. if you have got a tenant um, complaining about a certain issue which could um, relate to safety, um, it, it's worth showing that, um, ensuring you've got a good audit trail of correspondence and that you're actually trying to do something about it. Absolutely, yeah, I couldn't emphasize that strong enough, yeah. Okay, um, back to penalties. Could you tell, talk a bit about penalties and what the 
powers of, of the HHSOS are to, to yeah. enforce. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, what, there's, there's various notices that they can serve on the landlord depending on what they find at fault with the property. So, I mean, uh, I suppose the most gentlest notice would be the improvement notice, mm -hmm. which would normally apply to Category 2 hazards, even though it can apply to Category 1 hazards with exception, but that would be very unusual, but it has happened before. Um, but it is an improvement notice. It gives a landlord a certain uh, amount of time prescribed in the notice in order to put right the, the, um, the defaults as found by the local authority. Um, however, there are more serious notices depending on whether an improvement notice is not adhered to or whether the actual hazard is of a more severe nature. So, for example, um, the local authority can serve a prohibition order. Okay, which is banning the use of all or part of a dwelling. So it can be used just for example, they may find a problem with one particular room in the property um, and they can serve a prohibition order on the room mm. or they could serve it on the entire property if they feel that they need to do so. Um, there is such thing called an, an emergency action order, okay, which does apply to category one hazards. An emergency action order is does not usually contain very much notice to the landlord. If the landlord fails to comply, the local authority, after having served that notice, will be quite quick to carry out the repairs themselves and bill the landlord for mm. that. Um, and then they can even issue a demolition order, which I won't go into too much. It's very, very scary, really, but it, 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 you don't really need to explain too much about it. You know, it says, it says what it is. <laughs> hopefully there's not many landlords that apply to you. <laughs> no, but. and I mean, you know, I mean, and, and with even more exceptional cases, and this usually applies to more sort of commercial developments rather than residential developments, they have the power to issue a clearance order, which would be to, unclear, you know, to clear an entire development, to destroy an entire development yeah. on the grounds of health and safety. Okay. So I think, it, as, as we said before, it just comes down to common sense. You build yourself a checklist at the start of every tenancy, um, and make sure you're, you're covering all those points. Um, make sure you're communicating really well with your tenant mm. um, and keeping good audit trails. And and you should always should you shouldn't get to the point where notices are being served on you. No, absolutely. I mean, if you are in any doubt, then obviously you can contact. You know, you can get onto the gov.uk website. You can contact the health and safety executive on the hse.gov.uk. Yeah. Uh, you could look us up on the NLA library because we've got all the information there as well. And Technically, you should be able to go straight to HHSRS at your local council and ask them for guidance and advice. However, this isn't something I do tend to advise straight away, and that would probably be a, a last resort avenue, really, because the problem is is that they might actually want to come out and inspect the property, and uh, yeah. you know, it could open up a can of worms. But then, having said that, they don't open up can of worms that don't actually exist. Sure, sure. Okay, so moving on to Legionella, which is. Um, an interesting subject because a lot of landlords feel that, uh, well, they're liable potentially, but they don't know what to do about it because there's no clear legislation about what they need to do about it sure. or clear guidelines. Mm. And then there's a lot of companies that say, um, have your Legionnaire, Legionella um, test for £200. You need to do this. You need to do this on a yearly basis. And yep. That's not true. Yeah. Um, so can you kind of clear that up for us? Yeah, please? no problem at all. Yeah, I know you're quite right. If we get a few calls on the advice line about sort of various scams from agents, yeah, charging quite high amounts of money saying it is a lawful requirement that you have this done. Um, well, yes, it is a lawful requirement that you have it done. So what they're saying is, is kind of true, but when they say it's costing £200 because we've got to send a specialist guy in to do it, that's not true. Um, so I will clarify this. Um, briefly, what I'll just do is explain a little bit about what Legionella is, because a lot of people, I think, are uncertain of actually what it is, okay? And it's a bacteria which is commonly found in natural water sources, but in low numbers, hence if you go for a dip in, in the river or something like that, um, uh, then it's, you, it's usually not a risk to you if you accidentally swallow a bit of river water. Mm -hmm. You probably would be a bit sick for other reasons. You might get dysentery or something. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it anyway. Um, but the risk is relatively low. Now, it's sometimes found in water systems, in commercial and residential properties as well, hence that there's the risk that needs to be addressed. What it is though, it's a bacteria which can develop to form a fatal form of pneumonia. 
basically. So that's how it gets to you. If it gets in your lungs and you're vulnerable due to illness or age or whatever reason, then yes, you can contract a very, very nasty strain of pneumonia, which tends to be fatal. Um, bacteria can grow in favourable conditions, and this is what landlords need to be aware of, because some of those favourable conditions may be existing in their properties, so they need to identify the risk and, and, and act upon this. What the risk conditions are is in freestanding water areas where the water temperature could be between 20 degrees Celsius and 45 degrees Celsius. So but that range of temperature is the optimum uh, temperature range for the breeding of the, um, of the, sal um, of the uh, pneumonia pathogens. Okay. Um, so like I say, it's often in stored freestanding water areas or where there's going to be recirculated water as well within the same system. Okay. And also anywhere where it's likely for any deposits for the bacteria to be able to feed on may occur in the water, such as rust or sludge, for example. Sure. Okay. So to clarify the responsibilities of landlords, okay, the landlord does have a legal duty to assess and control the risk of the exposure of this, okay. Um, to, but health and safety law does not require a testing certificate. So that's where there's often the ambiguity. You do need to do the testing, but you don't have to actually demonstrate to it. HSE executive does not recognise a Legionella sure. testing certificate. Okay. Um, Section 3.2 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 makes provision for relevant health and safety legislation to apply to landlords. So this is what is underpinning landlords. Also, the other legislation that underpins the testing of this in HMOs is the Multiple Occupation in England Regulations 2006. Okay, um, so that's what's uh, 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 underpinning it. Now, in order to conduct the test, it's really not difficult at all. You have to identify the hazard areas, which areas of freestanding waters. So, obviously, your cold water storage tank is the first thing that comes to mind. But other things should be considered as well, like truncated pipe work that serve that would serving a, an appliance or a system that's no longer used. You might have a little nub of a pipe where water is still present there, and that pipe can be exposed. You know, can produce sludge and rust and all that sort of thing. Um, I mean, if you're really in doubt, then you can just get a sample from all the taps and, sure. and, and test that as well. And I think it's just a very good idea to do it. You know, I don't think you should just really just say, oh, I'm just going to do the tank and that's it. Sure. Do everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very, very simple test. All you have to do is to take the temperature of the water and if it's below 20 degrees or if it's above 45, 50, the chances are you're going to be okay. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be cold water you're going to be testing anyway, because yeah. that's going to be, you know, most the only time you've got hot water standing is if you've got an immersion tank. Mm. Uh, so, you know, providing you take the temperature and it's below the 20, then that should be fine. What you do need to do is that you do need to obviously make a full record of what you tested, where and when you tested it, and at what time, and what the outcome, what the temperature mm. reading is. But then you then just file that yourself at home and keep it there for your records in case you audited it. Sure. Yeah. So a, a, a risk area could be a shower that hasn't been used for a year. Absolutely. Um, so that, that would be something that you'd, yeah, if absolutely. you had a property with an additional one suite that wasn't used, yeah. you, it would be quite important that you test that. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Particular attention if there's large voids in between occupancies must be paid to, I think, yeah. 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 Okay. okay, and um, if one of my tenants falls ill and I can't prove that I've done a test, could I be held liable for this? Well, potentially. I mean, this is like with all these things, you know, if it goes up in, in, it ends up in court, then it's down to a judge to decide, really, and sure. then you have to look at what reasonable steps would have been taken. Um, I mean, obviously, with a, a Legionella diagnosis, um, then the suspected water source, w you know, w would, would immediately be tested, and if it was found to be positive and you couldn't demonstrate that you had made a test of this, then yes, you could be found liable because you would have been in breach as it is a legal duty to, to have tested it anyway. And liability, is there, is there fixed penalties or is it...? Um... Well, it, it really depends on what the outcome is. You know, if someone has fallen gravely ill or if there's been a loss of life, then mm -hmm. you, you could be looking at a custodial sentence potentially. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, in terms of proving you've done this, um, there's no required proof, but it's it's down to the audit trail. And, it is, yeah. Um, 
again, as we said before, doing a, a separate document, a checklist, and, and putting that in, into your inventory. Yeah. Getting the t- tenant to sign it doesn't hurt. Um, it's, it's having that paper audit trail that, Absolutely. that could be important yeah. um, if it came to it. Yeah, sure. Well, Simon, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, obviously, if anyone's got any questions, then please do email us. We're going to do a follow-up uh, post where uh, Simon will be answering any, any particular questions that we haven't covered um, or we'll be pointing you back to the relevant place within the webinar. Um, if you've got any feedback about the webinar or any, or any topics you'd like us, like us to cover in the future, please do inf- um, email info at urban.co.uk. We'd be happy to hear your feedback. Well, thanks again, Simon. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been nice speaking to you both. Thank you. Thank you.